Uh, I'm excited to present uh, kind of a collection of thoughts and some, uh, some work really thinking about um, the behavioral economics of both health and insurance. And I'll describe a little more what I mean, um, but really trying to think about some of these issues that we've talked about more generally. And given the theme and given kind of the folks here thinking about opportunities in this space, how we think about targeting that to particularly lower income populations. So, you know, what I want to do is start by just thinking about health uh, and health insurance and income. Um, and one thing, you know, we were talking a little bit earlier, there's so many ways in which, you know, health is incredibly, multi I mean, many things are multifaceted, but health is so multifaceted you could tackle any number of things. Uh, I'm actually going to end up focusing even a little more on health insurance. I hope I'll convince you that that's actually central to health writ large, particularly for lower income populations. But also I think it has a nice, some of the themes hopefully will uh, be salient to the other features and the other domains that we're talking about today uh, and yesterday. So FinTech and EdTech and the workforce. Uh, then I want to talk uh, revisiting um, Obamacare and actually thinking about technology and insurance and thinking about some of the successes and failures that we saw there uh, and also kind of what we might learn from that. Uh, and then diving into some bigger thinking about kind of where simple economics in the healthcare domain really has gone wrong. Um, and I'll say it as an economist, this, we think of it through a simple economic lens, but I also think it's the way a lot of technologists and companies think about these problems um, and try to convince you that a more subtle form of thinking, particularly bringing in behavioral insights and richer data and technology actually might be a solution and an opportunity. Uh, and then maybe show you at the end one very specific manifestation of that, which is using uh, AI technology to improve matching of people to insurance plans um, and actually showing that implemented uh, and hopefully working. So uh, for those of you who uh, haven't had coffee yet or far back, what I, I'll, I'll describe this. This is the percentage of the federal poverty line. So this is the poorest Americans over here. This is from the Medical Expenditure Panel Survey. So a very valuable representative sample of the US. This is the share of the population reporting their health status uh, is poor. Um, there's a lot of ways to calibrate this. I'll suffice it to say that the correlation with conditions, diseases, and spending means that this is a very sick level uh, of the population. And if we look at the gradient, it's incredibly steep with respect to income. That moving up the poverty distribution dramatically lowers the rate at which you're reporting that you're actually in very poor health. This probably is not news, um, but I think it is striking to see how strong this gradient uh, is in the US. Uh, and another way to think about this is, is also that that's not uh, something that actually we see universally. There is very often a relationship between uh, income and, and health, but the US actually is uh, uniquely problematic in that sense. Um, and I, I think this sort of captures it. This is from work by um, Heidi Williams and Emily Oster looking at, this is infant mortality. And the interesting thing, this is comparing the US uh, to Austria and Finland. Uh, they turn out to be pretty representative of most of Europe and most other rich countries. And what you can see is that, that prenatal, so when babies are born actually we're about the same, but by the end of a year, uh, we have much higher rates of infant mortality, okay? So, uh, and it's happening as people are going out into the world, babies are coming home, and this is a, a striking result. If you then divide this by uh, advantage level, this is a sort of a composite index of income, education, and job category, uh, it's really striking. That if you are wealthy in the US, we are doing as well as other countries on these domains. If you are not, if you're in the lowest income distribution, uh, this gap is huge. Basically, you're talking um, you know, a 75% higher infant mortality. This is not unique to uh, infant mortality, but I think it's an actually a, a really drives home the point that the experience of healthcare in the US is wildly different for different people, and it's largely a function uh, of income, education, uh, and access. If you also do this by geography, you get another striking result. For example, the difference between, if you're low income, in uh, the Pacific or the Northeast, so basically probably where many of your flights started and where you landed, uh, versus the South, uh, it's a 3x higher infant mortality for the lowest income groups. It's a huge distinction along a bunch of different dimensions. So,
that's, an that's a gloomy statement. That's an opportunity to address and improve these issues. And so let's talk a little bit about what technology uh, might do to address these issues. And, you know, I think, and I, you know, as a, a business school professor in the Bay Area and as an advisor to a lot of startups, there's a lot of enthusiasm and I think real uh, both uh, commitment and opportunity to say some of these new technologies that can improve health outcomes, particularly for chronic diseases, are going to be incredibly valuable for the lower 50% of the population, that that is where chronic disease rates are higher and that is where they are more manifest in bad outcomes. Now, what's a challenge? And this is going to echo a theme uh, we have been hearing uh, over the last two days, um, is that this is actually, I think, the first manifestation of the Apple Watch, and this is actually from Apple's advertising campaign. So this is sort of the narrative of, and you, you get up and say, wearable technology and digital health is going to change the health of Americans. And you see this picture, and I think that is what people think. And then you go and talk to Apple, and they say, we're, we're going to help everyone with their diabetes. Um, and you know, you don't have to be a clinician to see that, well, maybe this is not representative of chronic disease in the U.S., <laughs> uh, particularly as it relates to income. So the first image that came up when I actually uh, Googled uh, diabetes and income was, this is from uh, Richmond, Virginia, but I think particularly if you talk to some of the clinicians up here, this is, you know, maybe not exactly representative, but I think there is this big disconnect that's very important in health and in health and technology between the experience of what, you know, lots of people designing these tools, thinking about data to measure health and kind of how people should manage themselves uh, and the experience reality for a whole variety of reasons that are uh, absolutely consistent with the other issues we've been talking about, particularly in finance uh, and saving uh, of basically how can helping people help themselves requires, uh, you know, I think understanding what it's like to be in their shoes and that disconnect is often there. Okay. So let me return a little bit to uh, policy and some of the learning we've had around how uh, both policy and technology and business might start impacting uh, particularly the lower 50% in terms of improving health, okay? And I'm gonna return, as I mentioned, or talk a little bit about uh, insurance here. And so this is my, this is my brief stop on, on health generally. I'll return to it later, but I want to talk a little bit about insurance, not just because I think that's actually incredibly important uh, in the U.S. for getting people the right care uh, and the right access, also because it has, I think, again, lessons that it's very related to finance, fintech, and those kind of things. So let's return to our, our federal poverty line distribution. And it's not arbitrary where I cut it. I cut it precisely at the levels of subsidy and access that are associated with Obamacare. So if you want to start with what the original plan was uh, and actually what was implemented, um, and I'm going to argue fairly successfully for about two years, uh, three years, is that there was Medicaid expansion. So the intent was for the very poor, uh, particularly for men who are very poor, we were going to expand Medicaid universally, layer on top of that access to marketplaces that should provide uh, innovative and productive products uh, with subsidies and subsidies that are declining uh, in the level of income. And then on top of that, we basically bolt that on to an existing employer-sponsored health insurance um, system. Okay, so this was the idea. Uh, and, you know, I think in practice, there are plenty of blemishes, but there were some key features that made this market function both with respect to if I put on my sort of wonky policy hat at work, but it also was really important for innovations and innovations that actually impact health, uh, particularly for those lower income populations that were in those, these buckets. The first is there was so-called guaranteed issue and community rating. Basically, to do well in insurance, you could no longer just try to create products that sick people didn't want. And that's a huge change, not just in terms of the sort of uh, manifestation in the marketplace, but in how strategies uh, and how these large insurers were trying to run their businesses. Um, in the same time, you also had the individual mandate, just bringing uh, you know, more and more people into those pools. It was very striking at the time to walk into the C-suite of a big insurer, and the change was, how do we manage diabetes better? You, you know, that's not actually what they tend to th tend, have tended to think about and really are thinking about again. It's much more often, how do we not get diabetics on our rolls? That change is central because 
many of you as technologists, as investors, want to solve problems of helping people improve their diabetes care, it's much more profitable, much more effective to do that if you can sell your products to a distribution channel which already is covering everyone's health insurance. And that really was working, uh, I think, at least moving in those directions, and you did tend to see a lot more innovation on that domain. Uh, put differently, as a, you know, someone advising business school students doing startups, all of a sudden these kind of dreamy-eyed things that were going to help, you know, help chronic disease over the long run were getting a lot more investment. They were actually selling. Um, so that was, you know, there was plenty of blemishes, but it was moving that direction. But if we look at what actually happened in a lot of the states and then subsequently is happening more and more with the undermining of the ACA, the reality has been most states got a federal exchange, so the so-called Obamacare exchange, about 33 states that rejected setting up their own exchange. And you might say, well, that's okay. But it turns out uh, insurance and healthcare systems are very local and managing marketplaces is incredibly challenging. So if you look at Peter Lee at Covered California and the team he had in there uh, particularly early on, uh, it really was kind of a best and brightest situation. They've done a very effective job. The federal exchange, which was basically airdropped into 33 disparate and different states, um, did what they could, but it, it was not the kind of exchange that was going to provide innovative, personalized products in each of these states. And then in many of these same states, they erased the entire Medicaid expansion. So the group of poor people who were supposed to be receiving Medicaid expansion are then left out. It turns out actually the sickest of them decided to join the exchange and pay the high premiums. Uh, which basically leads to uh, un unraveling that pooling. Uh, and, and you ended up with this, and then on top of that, and I'm gonna talk about more of this shortly, is that the employer-sponsored insurance um, has increasingly put, quote, more skin in the game or driven consumerism. What is that practically speaking? It's higher and higher deductibles, you know, that probably all of you have also faced. Um, and so you have this mechanism, which looks pretty different than the kind of underlying, uh, at least, potential intent uh, of the um, ACA, or Obamacare. So what are the results, and this is a bit wordy, but I think what you have is this, this narrative coming out of um, particularly trying to undermine or, or roll back the ACA is that nobody likes the ACA, they haven't got the coverage they wanted, uh, these premiums are growing out of control, uh, and that people really hate the mandate. And there certainly is truth to each piece of this. I think in practice, the evidence tells a slightly different story, particularly prior to a lot of the uh, repeal and rollback, which is that you had truly remarkable coverage increases. You know, the U.S. dramatically increased insurance. There, there is much, there remains much at this point, but there, even in 2016, there remained much less to do. But we really got left to do. We got lots of people into care, uh, into coverage. Um, you had incredibly different results between states that expanded Medicaid and didn't expand Medicaid. You know, this is a theme that is increasingly happening, that the experience of being an American, particularly a poor American, is wildly different depending on which state you're in, and that is true along the domain of health insurance and healthcare. Um, and that led to markets being a very mixed success. And in particularly that enrollees, both on the exchanges and increasingly in employers, uh, see health insurance as less and less valuable for precisely the reasons that, that it's basically less valuable in the first dollar. And it's for efficiency reasons which we'll talk about, but this undermining of basically the risk protective benefit of insurance, I think, has led to a feedback loop, which is challenging, but also presents an opportunity, which I want to talk a little bit about. Okay. Um, so if we want to think about sort of four domains, and I may skip over the bottom one a little bit, but, but I want to sort of turn from this and think a little bit about where the kind of simple conceptual economics that drove a lot of this health policy might have gone wrong. Uh, and kind of how that might manifest itself in ways uh, folks in this room can think about addressing shortcomings or building new tools. So the first is, you know, the classic, uh, this is drilled into you, and I think it's, it's certainly still true on average, is if we get the incentive right, th incentives right, things will work better. How has that actually manifested itself in healthcare? Basically raising the deductible or raising cost sharing, trying to get people with skin in the game, help them price shop. This is particularly problematic for many of the reasons we've already talked about, if you are liquidity constrained, if you're cash strapped, if you're not good at planning, you're gonna get very different results, which I'll show you shortly. Um, we've really relied on market-based solutions. Those exchanges sitting in the middle uh, were 
a very different approach than other places have, have taken, which is to either with full single payer or places that very much regulate the set of insurance offerings, particularly provided to poor people, we basically said, subject to some broad constraints, if you can offer a product, come on down, right? And that's the hope that we're gonna get more innovation. Personalization, again, more products are better. Uh, where we did acknowledge, I think, that people had a hard time navigating this domain, particularly people who'd previously been uninsured, were on constrict, uh, constrained budgets, the information provided was um, complex at best. Uh, you know, let's provide you all the detail of a health insurance product and assume that someone is gonna be able to sort that out amongst many other things, or let's provide them an expert on the phone who may or may not know what they're doing. And then lastly, you had a lot of private sector innovation that was relied upon, which is we're gonna facilitate lots of entry, which again is predicated on this idea that these big plans can come in and provide innovative new tools that's gonna to help people manage their health uh, and improve outcomes. This to me is I think striking from a financial perspective of what uh, has actually happened over the last uh, 10 years, basically, in terms of the complexion. This isn't even just the bottom 50%. This is the average, you know, the population in the U.S. This here, if you look at uh, workers' earnings uh, and overall inflation, they're basically keeping track. This is the premiums that we hear a lot and worry a lot about. They, and they are going up faster than, than wages, but it's incredibly striking. This is the average deductible, that not only are people's health insurance getting more expensive, uh, and dramatically so, that along with that increase in expense for the premiums, there's actually less coverage going to people. Similarly, this is for 2019, for each state, the share of people enrolled in what's called a bronze plan. All the health people know what this is, but this is basically the high deductible version that is available for uh, ACA en enrollment. Uh, it has about 66% actuarial value, put differently for the average enrollee and the average poor subsidized enrollee, they're expected to pay somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 40% of their total healthcare spending. Um, and so that, you can understand why, well that doesn't sound like the kind of thing that might solve a lot of these healthcare access and financial issues associated with health. And you know, just to show you, at least from some of my own work, kind of what happens when people go into these plans, this is an absolutely unrepresentative population. This is not the bottom 50% of Americans. This is a set of Americans who uh, are highly educated, high income, uh, the best setting in which you could actually uh, respond effectively potentially to these kinds of plans. This, this is uh, inflation adjusted, so look at the lower curve here. This is when we introduce the high deductible health plan. You see a dramatic and sustained drop in spending. Okay? So the, the policy wonks say this is fantastic, we're controlling healthcare costs, we're getting what we need out of this. Um, and similarly, a state exchange says actually this is why we want people in bronze plants, because we don't want excessive spending. If we look then by health status, uh, you see dramatic differences. This is the sickest population. The sickest population here is actually dropping their spending by the most. This is precisely the opposite set of incentives that you want. That the sickest people, the people with the most chronic conditions, we do this by chronic conditions, uh, are the ones cutting back spending the most. Uh, if we look here, and I'll just, there's a lot of numbers here, but I think, you know, if we look at high value care, when these high deductibles are introduced, when bronze plans are introduced, you see dramatic reductions across all kinds of high value preventive services. I'll, I'll, diabetes drugs drop by 40%, statins by 47%. These are high value, low cost things you want people taking. So the incentives here, are not, and, and I will say that we're also finding a reduction in sort of low value care that you think about, but these kinds of simple tools don't seem to be working even for the most uh, predisposed to uh, find success, let alone as we roll them out into the lower parts of the income distribution. Um, and I think that's kind of one of many challenges to Obamacare. I wanna think a little bit also about the fact that, that these exchanges and the way in which we deliver access to healthcare, particularly to the lowest income Americans, it's not uh, distinct from the way we deliver, deliver a lot uh, of publicly subsidized or privately offered sets of solutions to real problems, is that we rely on uh, basically some kind of market which is gonna depend on well-informed consumers disciplining the market, asking for products that are good for them. And that can be an incredible challenge on average, but it's particularly challenging if you think about trying to solve problems for people in the lower end of the income and education distribution. Um, and I wanna show you some, I think a concrete example of this, which this is some new work using non-American data. This is the universe of data from the Netherlands. And 
uh, without getting too into the weeds, um, we can actually link it to specifically what degree people had, specifically where they live and how much income they have. And there, they're, you know, I'm, again, I don't wanna get too, too detailed on it, but they're basically offered a very constrained set of insurance products. Um, so the regulator limits the set of uh, plans they can choose. Uh, and in particular, we're gonna think about a decision where you can choose a high deductible, low premium, or uh, a low deductible, higher premium plan. Okay, so as simple a choice as one might be able to, to find. Uh, and what we find is that this is the basically the probability uh, of choosing that, that uh, low deductible. If you want to think about what the right decision is here, right at 50%, you should always choose the, you should always, this should go to one. Everyone should choose above 50% and nobody should choose below 50%, okay? If we look at up here, um, again, at the bottom, because that's the default, most people make the right decision. As we move up, the degree to which people actually are able to effectively make this choice is strikingly related to their education level. That the difference between basically less than high school and this is uh, master's and PhD uh, is very large. On the other hand, you'll also notice that on average, even at the upper end of the distribution, people aren't able to make these choices effectively. Um, if we then go and dive in on the specific degree which these people had, uh, you see a striking result. And it does jump out. Statisticians are the best, objectively. Um, <laughs> I've actually ignored economists, they're kind of in the middle. Um, but uh, uh, so statisticians, they do very well. They're still only making the right decision about half the time. But what you'll notice, I think more materially here, is the rate at which uh, this is security guards, hair and beauty service, basically, uh, I know we're not, we're, um, different skill jobs, we're not saying lower skill, but basically lower education service jobs uh, are very ineffective in making these choices. Now this is one manifestation, but I point it out because this is something that we, I think we as uh, more technocratic policy side or, tech or, or uh, business leaders say, more choice is good. Lots of the recent reforms, particularly even policy-oriented reforms, have basically relied on choice. And, and we do this many other ways. The gradient with respect to choice with, with education, with income, the urban-rural divide, where you live, turns out to determine your choice dramatically more than your underlying uh, opportunity to gain from switching benefits. And this is something that's important to consider if we start thinking about, well, why does, for example, rural low-income America resent the fact that we gave them health insurance? Well, we gave them health insurance in an environment in which it was very difficult to choose. The plan that they ended up paying a lot for every month didn't actually cover anything when they showed up at the hospital. It's perhaps not surprising that even though ex ante we said, here's a great option for you, the realization of that uh, may not man be manifest in the same way we expected. Hmm. So let me, uh, how much time? Have I, we started slightly late, but. Yeah, I'd say maybe two more minutes. Two more minutes, perfect. Yeah. Okay, let me just very quickly then try to end on a slightly more positive note and a, and a bit of a glimmer for uh, <laughs> what technologists could do. So, so this is a recent uh, piece of work basically looking at, uh, this is the Medicare Advantage market. This is, um, actually, again, not representative of what you would see probably in an exchange today, but if anything, a better environment. So this is a uh, Aon Hewitt's Navigators Exchange for basically retirees. This is an all of AT&T retirees. There's certainly many people in the lower end of the income distribution here. This, what this is, is basically, it turns out who you get on the phone, these so-called experts that are supposed to help you overcome this problem, uh, are not very good at doing this either. That in fact, this is into to quintiles that if you get somebody that's the best versus the worst, the top 20% versus the bottom 20%, that's costing the average Medicare enrollee about $1,000 in this environment. And again, if we wanted to go and say who's good and bad, we actually wouldn't find, they're all spending about an hour on the phone trying to figure this out. They've all been doing this for four years. It's this sort of traditional mechanisms to overcome these information problems and make this market work are really not there. Um, so what could we do? I want to show you one application uh, of basically, uh, and I think this is a theme that we've been hearing over and over again. Here, the AI backbone, basically there's a decision support tool that's offered to these experts a long time, alongside the traditional software they use for enrollment. What is AI in this context? It's literally this score, a color coding, and then a personalized prediction for cost. But that turns out to be incredibly important that we find that the, the experts are able to integrate this AI effectively and efficiently, that um, 
choices improve. So this is the distribution of choices. These are these really bad brokers before. Everyone improves if you look at that overall when these tools are available um, that in fact, the average person in this marketplace saved about $300. Now that may not see, seem big, but this is incredibly important for lower income enrollees. Um, if you think about that and scaling it up just by the size of this program alone, that's $62 billion a year, simply in waste because people are unable to make the right choices. I think more materially for what we're thinking about in the context of lower income Americans, uh, when we're offering them insurance and trying to expand coverage, these small seeming mistakes up front lead to very important manifestations downstream. So, you know, I'm sure there's many people here and you all know people trying to improve medication adherence or do some nice nudges to uh, figure out whether they'll take their statins. If you started by not getting a plan that even covered that drug in the first place, no amount of nudge is gonna actually help you take that, particularly if you can't afford to cover those meds at all. So I think this is the kind of opportunity, thinking a little bit more in the weeds and augmenting the existing institutions that's gonna be critical to uh, addressing the health issues uh, for the lower 50% of the population. So just to wrap up, you know, I think one hope here is that thinking a little more richly, not just simplistically about how people make decisions uh, and using the richer data, the richer data both within the health domain and then across these domains, particularly relating financial and social institutions back to health. So the policy environment's gonna be key to that, okay? And I think both uh, when, it's, when it's going well with respect to you know, things like the ACA, that can be an opportunity. And then conversely, which I just showed you is, if anything, making the wrong choice in an undermined ACA is even worse. So there are opportunities in both contexts. I would also argue that, you know, really, and this is sort of in the spirit of that uh, Apple Watch juxtaposition, that the less glamorous side is where the real action is. So Medicare and Medicaid, things like home health, um, which is not at all the typical lived experience of a technologist, uh, is where the action is, both in improving health and improving outcomes. Uh, and I also think that, that an important thing, and you know, many of you are very much experienced this, disruption uh, in healthcare is much more incremental. Um, you can't just put things out there and hope that you know, they pick it up like Instagram or Southwest just flies in. Um, it tends to be selling into large institutions and often only having one or two markets. But for better or worse, uh, healthcare is so big and so expensive and so important that you can be moving the needle just solving a problem, say, in East Palo Alto or just selling it to one insurer. And I think that's an important thing to think about, which tends to drive, particularly if I think about you know, bright-eyed MBAs, thinking about which career path, um, that can be a big issue. That, you know, how about going to a home health uh, setting with a 67-year-old? That does not sound as cool as a mixer in San Francisco. I think that kind of thing is a challenge. Uh, and then lastly, I think this is gonna be one, and we've heard this a lot, but particularly in health, Experts are trained uh, and have done a lot. You know, they've done a lot. They've been to med school to be here. This is a domain in which augmenting experts is likely to be a much more productive application, say, of AI and these new technologies going forward.